Hello, this is John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and we're here on Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions. We got a great resounding response from our viewers uh, on our request for questions. You guys just filled up my inbox, uh, filled up the comments. We got hit on a couple of the different message boards that we visit. So we've got a nice little list of questions here. I'm going to read them off and uh, we'll answer them one by one. So our first question is from Darth Colossus. This one came to us on YouTube. It says, why the name 8541 Tactical? Well, 8541 is the Marine Corps Military Occupational Specialty for Marine Scout Sniper. Uh, back in the day, this was a secondary MOS. Uh, it's the MOS that I was awarded. So instead of using Sniper Tactical, since Sniper is such an overused word in today's shooting industry, we decided to go with 8541 Tactical. It kind of keeps it a little bit on the down low. Guys that know, know what we're talking about. And of course, now you know what we're talking about. So that's the purpose behind 8541 Tactical. Back in Black asks, when truing your ballistics software to real world hits, what's better to change and why? BC or MV? Or do you find a combo of both and smaller changes works better? Well, what he's referring to by BC is ballistic coefficient. That's a number assigned to the projectile to tell you how aerodynamic it is. In MV, he's asking about muzzle velocity. When I am truing my actual dope to what my ballistic calculator is telling me, I will usually adjust muzzle velocity. Uh, the reason for this is you usually determine your muzzle velocity by shooting over a chronograph. Most of the chronographs that are out there are not laboratory instruments. They're not perfectly accurate. So they may be off on one side or the other. So by adjusting your muzzle velocity, you can correct that ballistic curve downrange. Now, if you're absolutely sure your muzzle velocity is on, then nothing hurts you by changing the ballistic coefficient just a little bit one way or the other to try to line things up. Basically, what you're doing is you're experimenting. Now, on ballistic coefficients, ballistic coefficients are kind of an advertising and marketing tool used by the bullet manufacturers. Everybody wants to have a better ballistic coefficient than their competitors. So it would not be out of the ballpark for a company to possibly inflate their ballistic coefficient just slightly to try to gain an edge. If you want a very accurate catalog of ballistic coefficients, you might want to pick up Brian Litz's book, Applied Ballistics. It has a list of ballistic coefficients in it. Our next question comes from Jarnatharn on YouTube. It's, what's the cheek pad you use in the bolt manipulation videos? I've been looking for one to put on my 700. I believe the uh, cheek piece he's talking about is the Green Eagle stock pack that we used on our Remington 700. Uh, you can purchase it from several different places across the internet, but it's an Eagle stock pack. Uh, it's one of the best things I've found to elevate your comb so that you can get a better cheek weld. As it comes out of the box, it only elevates your comb just slightly, but you can cut riggers or you can cut foam or isomat and stuff that underneath it, and it raises it up just a little bit, and it gives you a little bit more uh, comfortable place to put your face. Uh, the added bonus to it is it has a small storage compartment so you can put your dope card your scope tools um, spare ammunition in the pocket it also has uh, elastic loops on the outside of it that allow you to attach spare ammunition to the outside of the stock pack uh, as i said you can get them all over the internet just google uh, eagle stock pack and we'll leave a, a link in the comments section below on uh, where you can check to pick them up our next questions from Bobo T1234, what's the proper technique when shooting with an NVD, i.e. use the IR laser or use an NV compatible optic? What he's referring to by NVD is night vision device, um, which basically, instead of looking at the visible light, it uses the infrared light spectrum to uh, see. When you use a night vision device on a carbine, I prefer to have the night vision device mounted on my face or on my helmet. Uh, that way, wherever I look, I can see in the dark. Now, there's a couple of different techniques you can use uh, when you're using a carbine in conjunction with a head-mounted night vision device. You can either use a laser mounted on the carbine to look at your target and see where the dot is on the target. 
or you can run the night vision monocular if you're using a monocular on your support side eye for me it'd be my left eye i then run my aim point on my uh, rifle just like you normally would during day operations uh, you turn the dot on the aim point down to a reasonable setting for the ambient light conditions and when you bring it up because of the way your brain sees both eyes it'll superimpose the dot over the image that you're seeing through the night vision monocular that's another method now since we're more geared towards precision rifle shooting if you're using a night vision optic on or a night vision device in conjunction with a precision rifle my preference is to have the night division device mounted on the rifle uh, it gives you more precise aiming and it just gives you a better system overall the other thing you got to remember is that a IR laser still sends out radiation. It still illuminates the target. Anyone else that has night vision optics can also see this illumination. This can be good if you're working with a machine gun crew in a military environment or you need to laser the target for supporting units. However, if you're working a law enforcement role, you're not really going to want to do that because that's going to show everybody where you're at because you can just basically follow the beam back to its source. You're much better off using something like an AMPVS-22 mounted in front of your day optic. This also gives you the added benefit of when the sun comes up, you just take the clip on off and your day optic is already sighted in and ready to go. Next question comes from Stealth Shooter 100, also off of YouTube. Do you use a 22 trainer? I've got several 22 caliber rifles that I use. I've got a Savage Mark II BTVS, which is a nice stainless uh, thumb hole laminated 22. Um, I use that as my uh, repeating 22 rifle because it comes with a five or a 10 round magazine. Uh, it allows you to stay in position and continue to fire just like you would run with a full size bolt gun. I also have a Remington 40XB 22, which is an extremely accurate 22 rifle. It also is a full-size rifle and pretty much mimics the dimensions of a Remington 700. Now, you don't need to have an exact duplicate of your primary rifle to get the benefit out of a 22 trainer. Uh, neither of my 22 trainers exactly duplicate any of my primary rifles. My main goal with the 22s is to hone my trigger control, my follow through, and sometimes positional shooting. Uh, it's a whole lot easier on the wallet to shoot 22s from a standing position than it is to burn up match 308. Don't get hung up in having to duplicate the optic and the stock and everything that's on your primary rifle. What's more important is that you have an inexpensive way to get out and actually get some trigger time. Justin Schuler from YouTube writes, what techniques have you found that work best at keeping you on target when you fire so that you can see your hits or misses? Uh, what Justin's asking about is follow through. Uh, basically, when you complete the firing process and the rifle fires, you want to stay exactly behind the rifle with your eyes on target to assess where your bullet impacts and if you need to apply a follow-up shot. Um, on the range, the best method that I've found is to set up your rifle on a stable platform, ground, shooting bench, what have you, and then to make your body as close to directly behind the rifle as possible. You want to give that buttstock something very stable to recoil against. When you do this, the rifle will stay pretty much lined up on target. Once you come back down out of recoil, your crosshair should be fairly centered on the target and you should be able to see where the bullet impacts at anything beyond 100 yards. When you start getting in very close, then the bullet's going to impact while the rifle is still in recoil. And unless you're in a really solid prone position, you may not be able to see it. If you're shooting in a prone position, there's no reason that you should not be able to actually watch a bullet at 200 yards impact on the target. It's a very helpful training tool because you can see immediately if you're off and if you need to apply a second shot. However, don't get into the habit of forgetting to call your shots. A very, very important thing, especially when you get on into competition shooting, is when the rifle recoils, you should automatically know if the crosshairs were on target when you press that trigger or not. When you're doing the closer range shooting on steel or on reactive targets, you need to be able to transition to the next target quickly. 
And that generally means that when you break the trigger, if you call that as a good shot and you know your crosshair was on the target, you want to be cycling the bolt and moving to the next target before you have time to actually look at that first target and see if it was a hit or not. JM Murdy on YouTube asks, nice video, what's your experience? Mr. MapX2010 also asks, this may have been covered before, but what are your qualifications? That being, did you serve in the military, Marines as your name implies, or police, or are you working on life experience? My background is I'm a Marine Corps school trained scout sniper. I'm also a uh, state trained police sniper. I'm also an NRA precision rifle instructor. I've got quite a bit of background. I've been shooting rifles uh, pretty much as far back as I can remember, uh, starting with my father teaching me how to shoot 22 rifles when I was a kid, up through my military service, professional training on the M16A2, M40A1, and several other weapon systems in the Marine Corps, and then moving on through my police career into professional training at our state academy. I also went through the NRA Precision Rifle Instructor training course, so I am a certified instructor in uh, the law enforcement precision rifle area. Uh, none of that really means a whole lot, though. There are a lot of guys out there with tons and tons of lines underneath their name talking about their qualifications. The key thing is it doesn't matter if I can do it. It only matters if I can teach you how to do it. That's the important part about being an instructor. You guys have to be able to understand what I'm saying and how to go about doing it. Now, granted, it is nice to be able to have some kind of background to tell you that I'm not just talking out of my rear end, that I've done this for a little while. But again, in the end, it's if I can relay what I can do to you. 0331 Tactical asks, what's your opinion on the Falcon Menace 5.5 to 25 by 56 or 4 to 14 by 44 tactical 30 millimeter rifle scope? Well, I've used the uh, 4 to 14 by 44 Falcon Menace for quite some time. I purchased one uh, shortly after they first started showing up. Uh, the one that I have is actually a skeletal mill dot reticle and MOA turrets. It was before they offered the mill mill version. Uh, and it's a fairly solid scope for the price range. I've never had any problems with it. The glass is decently clear. Uh, it's a little bit prone to lens flare. If you get a lot of bright light on the objective lens of the scope, it becomes a little difficult to see. Um, the adjustments were accurate. It tracked perfectly. Um, the clicks are not quite the greatest in the world, but again, we're talking about a $400 rifle scope. Uh, it's a very good option in that price range. Uh, I have not used any of their uh, latest scopes, so I can't tell you if the current production is still at that level. But for just banging steel, I think you may be okay with that scope. For hunting applications, you may have some problems with that scope because when you dial it down to 4 power for the 4 to 14, the reticle gets extremely, extremely fine. Uh, without any kind of illumination, anytime you get into a cluttered background, you're going to have a whole lot of trouble seeing that reticle. So that may be something to keep in mind. For banging steel out to 1,000 meters, it's going to be just fine. For a hunting optic, it may not fill your needs all that well. M2CO2NE2L on YouTube asks, whatever came of your Remington 700 SPS tactical with the Bell and Carlson stock? I was sure you put it in the AI stock, but I would like to hear about the low price tactical after the stock change. He's talking about our budget precision project, which you can see some of our other videos on the YouTube channel. Um, the project is still rolling. In fact, we just got the stock back from Bell and Carlson and had it inleted for a surgeon bottom metal. We'll be demonstrating to you what all goes into adding a removable magazine system to it here soon. Um, when you ask about the AI stock, uh, if you look at the videos, you'll see sometimes we're using an AI stocked rifle that actually is a complete accuracy international AE Mark II. Uh, it's not actually a stock system, it is a complete rifle from Accuracy International. Uh, it's one of the better rifles that we've tested. Um, that is actually my personal rifle. I purchased it from Accuracy International. It's not a loaner. Uh, it's the rifle that I use in my day-to-day, -day, and it's also my competition rifle. From YouTube, Ragam asks, John, for the 308, there are various twist rates. Common are 1 to 10, 1 to 11.25, and 1 to 12. What should a shooter look for in a multi-purpose barrel, long range slash hunting, off the shelf and then custom? 
Well, right now I've got 308 rifles in the safe that range from 1 in 12 twist to 1 in 10 twist. Uh, the two 1 in 10s that I have are the AAC Tactical and then also a Noveski barreled AR-10. Um, I can tell you that the 1 in 12s that Remington uses on most of their rifles, it'll accurately shoot anything from the bottom end from 155 grain uh, Lapua Cinars all the way up to 178 grain AMAX. Uh, I've shot both ends through it. Uh, my wife's competition rifle is a 1 in 12 twist uh, Remington 700, and we run 178 grain uh, AMAX and 178 grain Bowtail hollow points through it, and it's extremely accurate with those bullets. If you want to start getting beyond that into the 180, 190 grain, or even up to the 208 grain, you most definitely want to go with a faster twist. Um, I would suggest going with a, hundred, or a 1 in 10 twist, a 1 in 10 twist barrel will still shoot just about any bullet that you're going to want to fire for a long range purpose. Uh, on the lighter end, the Lapua 155s, the bullets are actually almost as long as 175 grain Sierra. And what you're looking at when you're evaluating a twist rate is the, actually the length of the bullet, not so much the weight. Longer bullets need faster twist rates to stabilize. Since the 1 in 10 will stabilize anything from the 155s all the way up to a 208 grain AMAX, which is about the biggest bullet that you want to stuff in a 308, if you're able to select a barrel twist, I would say go with the 1 in 10. However, if you come across a good deal on a 1 in 12, or you're buying an off-the-shelf rifle, there's no reason to stay away from the 1 in 12s. They'll still shoot most bullets well. Um, the 1 in 12 in my Accuracy International, I've actually shot 208 grain AMAX bullets through it, and at 300 yards it was grouping very nicely when we ran the workup test on those bullets. Uh, it's not ideally suited to those bullets, however it's workable, it's not going to be a problem. Smokin 07 Ram asks, John, can you talk about your opinions on the M110 versus M40 and where you see this going? To me, it seems as though I'm more flexibly served with a state-of-the-art gas gun from point-blank to, say, 80, 800 to 1,000 yards shooting. What's your take on the current reliability of the systems? Thanks for the great YouTube page. Well, smoking 07, uh, you're welcome. Um, my take on the current systems is I, I believe that we're going to start seeing a move in professional rifles away from the bolt-action rifles and more towards the semi-autos for intermediate ranges. Um, the semi-automatic rifles have come so far that they are extremely accurate and they are extremely reliable. Uh, but adding to that accuracy and reliability, you get fast follow-up shots, you get magazine changes, so you have either the ability to reload or to change ammunition types very rapidly. Um, additionally, in a military or law enforcement situation, you have the self-defense capability of that rifle, which greatly outstrips the ability of a bolt rifle. If you run into a problem, you would much rather be able to engage with a high-capacity magazine system and fast follow-up shots than you would be running a bolt in a 10-round magazine. Now, the reliability is really going to be based on what system you're dealing with and what system you're looking at. Different manufacturers' weapons are going to be different levels of reliability. Um, I have not tested enough of a variety of them in enough different conditions to be able to tell you that one is more reliable than the other. I can tell you that our AR-10 with our Noveski barrel that we've been using has been 100% reliable with every type of ammunition I've put through it. Um, I haven't even choked it when I was doing low workups with fairly low charges. So it's an extremely good system. However, that system gives, gives up a little bit of accuracy when compared to, say, my Accuracy International bolt gun. Now, specifically the M110 versus the M40, the M40 really, I think its time is coming close to an end. Um, it's a short action, longer barrel, very heavyweight platform. Um, it really does not do a whole lot of things that a high-end bolt or high-end semi-automatic gun cannot also accomplish. So I, I think you're going to see a military shift that direction. Uh, in law enforcement sites, I think you're still going to see bolt guns stick around for quite some time, just for the simple matter of the cost and the application of a law enforcement precision rifle. Um, 
you're not going to worry about the high magazine capacity because shots fired in a law enforcement situation are generally on the low end. Um, also, the bolt action system is still going to be a lighter, less expensive alternative overall compared to a semi-automatic system. Superfluid asks, John, in your experience, how important is rail cant when using NV equipment? I know the Marine Corps used Simrad's NV equipment, which virtually eliminates cant discrepancies. But let's say you had to deploy a system that mounts in front of the objective lens. If you had a Badger EFR, for instance, coupled with a 30 MOA pick rail for your optic, what change in POI discrepancies are we to expect? Is it an advantage to go for a monolithic rail in this case? Well, since I'm far from an expert in night vision, I referred to one of the industry's experts, which is Victor from Tactical Night Vision Company. Uh, Victor was kind enough to take some time out of his day and reply to our response. And here's what Victor wrote. Simple answer is modern day clip-ons such as the AM PVS-22 and AM PVS-27s have no zero issue if the day optic is candid or not. These devices are optically aligned so well that even if the day scope is half an inch high or low or left or right of the clip-on device, there will be no point of aim, point of impact issues. One may suffer a bit of resolution loss through the clip-on in these instances, if not a perfect center, but no point of aim, point of impact issues. Well, again, thank you, Victor, for taking some time out of your day to answer that question. Uh, it helps us a lot, and hopefully throughout this series, when we run into a question that's really out of my ballpark or a little bit out of my center of expertise, we'll be able to call on some people throughout the industry to answer questions for us. The People's Defense asks, once you have a rifle sighted in for 100 yards, do you experiment with getting it on target at, say, 500 yards, or is there a way to get it close by some simple formula? New to long distance shooting, that's why I ask. Well, most of us use ballistic calculators that you can find online. JBM Ballistics is a great resource, and I will put the link below the video here. Um, if you don't have access to JBM or you don't like doing a whole lot of math, then most of the manufacturers, they uh, put the ballistic information on their box of ammo or they'll post it on their website, and they'll use a estimated muzzle velocity, and that ballistic information will get you close. Uh, once you've zeroed at 100 yards, the best way to confirm your zero is to actually shoot 200 yards, 300 yards, 400 yards, 500 yards, and on out at 100 yard increments and log that in your data book. It's extremely time consuming, it takes a lot of ammunition, but that's a way you can be 100% sure of what your dope is at that temperature and those environmental conditions. Now, I prefer ballistic calculators because while I may zero my rifle in the summer, I may shoot a match somewhere on the other side of the country that's in totally different environmental conditions. And you just don't have the time or the ammunition to be able to shoot each yard line at a strange place in order to confirm what your dope is. So then we rely on ballistic computers like KAC Bullet Flight or Ballistic FTE that you can get on your iPhone or uh, now a lot of them are available on the Android platforms. So those are a very good resource if you have the ability. On Facebook, Darden Arthur asks, for a viewer request, I'd like to see if you can do a review on a white phosphorus night vision device and the new Black Hawk bipod that swivels and traverses. Well, the white, white phosphorus night vision devices are fairly cost prohibitive, but if we get some manufacturer support, I'd be happy to do a review on them. On the Black Hawk Bipod, we may have to look into that. We do a whole bunch of reviews on a different range of equipment. So that may be something we're interested on doing in the future. Daniel Bowflex Lamb asks, how important is truing a rifle action? Then Brian Futch asks, I know truing a 700 without barreling is a waste. How about rebarreling without truing? Well, the importance of truing a rifle action is really gonna depend on what action you're talking about. Uh, if it is a factory Remington 700 action, then there may be some discrepancies in the action. There may be some surfaces that are not um, square with the bolt. They're not gonna be square with the bore. And that'll give you a little bit of issues. It's very common to have a Remington 700 that one bolt lug is making contact and the other bolt lug is either not only making partial contact or no contact at all. In that case, 
you're going to get a little bit more durability and incremental advance in accuracy by truing the action. However, it's a complete waste to true an action and then put a factory barrel back on. The majority of your accuracy is coming from the barrel. Um, I would really suggest that you hold off on truing an action until you decide to replace the barrel. When you replace the barrel, uh, many smiths will true the action as part of replacing the barrel. Now, if we're talking about a custom action like a, a Templar action or a surgeon or a stiller, um, truing probably is not going to get you a lot. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience with actually running the machines and checking the run out on these actions and checking how true the surfaces are. But from Smiths that I've talked to, there's really not a lot involved with those because when you pay for a custom action, you're paying for those surfaces to be correct when they leave the factory. Now, rebarreling without truing a rifle is completely and totally possible. However, since you have the barrel off at that time and most of the surfaces that you need to true can be accessed at that time, I would go ahead and have the action trued. Uh, most smiths really do not charge that much extra to true the action when you're doing that and some may not even install a barrel for you without truing the action. Uh, some smiths out there are very protective of their name and of their work and they just really won't cut corners on their work. So that's going to be between you and your smith. Um, I would say that when you have questions like this and you're preparing to have work done on a rifle, make sure you talk to the custom shop that you're dealing with. Explain them your concerns, explain to them the use of your weapon or your rifle, and they'll give you a good basis on that. Jeremy Decker asks, let's talk technique. Your take on the hard cheek weld versus a soft cheek weld. Think carbine like put your cheek into the stock versus precision soft style. Well, the technique that I generally use is to get behind the rifle and lay my head down on it with the same amount of pressure that you would lay your head on a pillow when you go to sleep. I'm not trying to induce any additional muscle strain or additional pressure in the stock of the system. So I want to lay my cheek on there and just relax my neck, relax my face, and the weight of my head is pretty much the only weight that is pushing down on the stock. I'm not grinding my cheek into it. If you find yourself doing that, you're going to get inconsistent pressure from shot to shot. It's easy for me to relax my neck and let gravity handle the amount of pressure that my head is putting on the stock versus me pushing down with my neck muscles and trying to exert the same amount of pressure from shot to shot. If you're in doubt, test it out. Try a couple of different things, but definitely try just relaxing and letting your cheek rest on the stock naturally. I think you'll find that that is the most consistent from shot to shot. Jared Baumkamp asks, It seems the Achilles heel to many in long range shooting is reading the wind and compensating for its effects. Maybe you could do a tutorial on reading wind. I know it would be a lot of information to condense, but it may be of help to many shooters, myself included. Kind regards. Well, Jared, we're definitely looking at doing a complete episode on wind reading. It is way too in-depth of a subject for me to get into on our short question and answer video here. So you'll have to look forward to a full episode on that. But I do agree with you. One of the things that makes the difference between a good shooter and a great shooter is the ability to call wind. Very often competitions are won or lost on your ability to make a good wind call. So we definitely want to get into that a little bit later. Wade Overton asks, Rifle fitting has always been an issue for me. I'm six foot four and lanky. If you have any tips or guidelines to find proper length of pull, trigger and hand grip, and cheek placement, I would love to hear them. Another related question is when using a variable power scope on my hunting rig, I have to change my head position as the magnification changes. Any tips to minimize this would also be appreciated. Thanks again. Well, wait, a very easy way to check the length of pull is when you take a rifle stock you simply grip the pistol grip and place your finger where the trigger grip or where the trigger would be and as you bring the stock back the butt stock should be right about where the inside of your elbow is that tells you you've got a good length of pull now this isn't a hard and fast rule on precision rifles because as you get behind them if it's a little out or a little further back in then you can still shoot the rifle accurately my preference, if I had to go one way or the other, would be for the stock to be a little bit longer. When you start getting in short, then you start getting your face very close to that scope. With the 308, 
you run the risk of possibly getting scope bite where the scope comes back and hits you in the eyebrow if you get too far up on that scope. Now, length of pull is really easy to fix if you have a rifle that has too short of a length of pull. You can go down to your Army Surplus store and get a military issue foam sleeping mat. It's just green foam rubber. Cut out a couple of pieces of that in the shape of your butt pad. Stick them on there, run some rigorous tape over it, and you'll have a really good improvised uh, spacer for your buttstock. It'll also give you still a little bit of cushion. Now, if you want to make a more permanent fix, then take it to a gunsmith or you can do it yourself. Remove the butt pad, take some layers of plastic, put them in there, sand them smooth, stick your butt pad back on, and you're good to go. Now, as far as your scope issue, with having to change your placement of your head on the stock versus the magnification of the scope. When you set a scope into the rings and you actually set up its initial position, you want to do so with the scope set on the highest magnification. The highest magnification, your eye relief is most critical. It's, it's the shortest distance possible versus low magnification. Now, when you're setting the scope in, you want to make sure that you do so with your body in the position that you're most likely to use the rifle in. Uh, most of the time that I'm shooting precision rifles, I do so in the prone position. So when I set my scopes up, I set my scopes up in the prone position. But I also check them from a bench position. When you get up on the bench, it seems you like to get a little bit closer or further away from the scope than the prone. So that's something to keep in mind. For me, when I get on the bench, I'm a little bit further back. It seems that when I'm in the prone, I'm the closest to the scope that I would possibly be. But... If you're a hunter, you're going to shoot the rifle standing. You want to make sure you check that, that eye relief in the standing position. Brian Futch asks, I've seen you talk about not wasting time loading perfect ammo. Go over your steps and what you think is important in hand loading. Well, Brian, again, that's something that is a little bit too in-depth for us to get into on our question and answer video here. We do plan on doing an episode on my techniques for hand loading. If you're a bench rest shooter, you can pretty much gloss over that because what I believe is important for precision rifle games is a little bit different than what a lot of people go through on bench rest loading. Um, I don't believe you need to do things like neck turning and weighing your brass and all that stuff, but we'll get a little bit more in depth into that later on in another episode. Jason Warren asks, can you discuss bullet seating depth versus velocity and pressure? Well, Jason, I can tell you right off the bat that you're going to see a whole lot more pressure with the bullet jammed into the lands than you are with the bullet backed off into the case. However, I don't really get into testing that. For the precision rifle games, I like to load to magazine length because we need a repeater. Uh, very seldom are we going to have the ability to sit in single load rounds. So it doesn't really matter to me if I may get an incremental gain in accuracy with the bullet seated touching the lands or seated just off the lands if that cartridge will no longer fit in my magazine. So I like to run magazine length and then we go from there. We tune other factors such as charge weight to see what our best accuracy is. Jay Ventius on Sniper's Hide asks, I'd be interested in how many rounds you think is an accurate measure of whether a particular rifle likes a factory load. I'm stuck with factory stuff for now, so if I don't have to spend 40 plus dollars for two boxes or more of factory match load, if one box or 20 rounds will serve as a sufficient test. I'll pass on the multiples and be able to give a wider variety of rounds a try. In my opinion, you should be able to tell if your rifle likes a particular load with one 20 round box. What I like to do is shoot four five shot groups and you need to take your time with each shot. Make each shot an individual shot for five shots, then move to another group and make each shot its own shot for five shots. After 20 rounds, you should be able to take a look at that and get an average group size between the four five shot groups and be able to compare that to what your rifle's accuracy is with other rounds. Um, that splits the difference between statistical significance and just dumping tons of money on ammo that your rifle doesn't particularly like. Also on Sniper's Hide, Stan Wood Spartan asks, Night 4 scopes, good or bad? 
I can definitely tell you that Night Force scopes are good scopes. They're a great option. We actually have a Night Force F1 that's inbound that we'll do our own uh, review video on. And you guys will get to see uh, how accurate and what good features the Night Force scopes offer. Off of AR15.com, Night Dive asks, I'm still hoping for a video on proper cleaning for precision rifles, both light cleaning, lubing, and full teardown and detailed cleanings. Also, what to look for during inspections, signs of unusual wear, or parts that may need replacement, etc. Thanks for putting in the time and doing this stuff. Well, Knight, you're welcome. Uh, I enjoy doing this stuff. We are going to get into another episode specifically on cleaning. I'm a Remington Certified Armor, so I can break down and show you what you need to look for on Remington 700s. But I'm also going to try to broaden it to show you what you need to look for and what the proper cleaning procedure is on gas guns and a couple of other types of bolt guns. But Again, it's a little bit more detailed for the question and answer, so I'm going to go ahead and skip that for now, and we'll put that in a separate episode a little bit later on. D-RASO3 asks, proper way to load a bipod? Well, loading a bipod is a pretty simple deal. Basically, what you want to do is you want to set your rifle down on target, stand up behind the rifle, get straight back behind it. What I like to do then is drop to my knees, drop totally to the ground, and slide forward until the buttstock contacts my shoulder. Now you want the buttstock in the pocket of the shoulder, not really up on the collarbone, get it in that pocket. What I then like to do is pull the rifle towards me and raise my upper body slightly off the ground. I then, that pulls the bipod feet just a little bit closer to you. I then just like to relax my body down to the ground and that natural pressure of my shoulder behind the rifle gives you that loading on the bipod. I'm not pushing my shoulders into the bipod, I'm just relaxing to the ground and allowing gravity to do its job. Flashhole on AR15.com asks, Hey Lone Wolf, any clue when your review of the new Super Sniper will be done? Kind of anxious to see what you think of it. Well, we have a Super Sniper 5 to 25 power right here. It's just waiting for us to get some time to get it on the rifle and get out and give it a whirl. From TRW Motorsport, any plans on testing a Bushy HDMR? We also have the Bushnell HDMR. This one actually has a Tremor 2 horse reticle in it. Uh, we're planning on getting this out to the range uh, shortly here, and we'll get some good time turning on it. Uh, we've already spent some time looking through it, and uh, we'll be commenting on the glass clarity and some other issues that are cropping up all over the internet. But it's going to be a couple of weeks before we can get to that. To make this work, we need your questions. Please send your questions to us by posting them in the comments section below or by sending them to us on Twitter or Facebook. We'll sift through them and select the best questions to be answered on the next week's episode. Don't wait. Please send us your questions now.